Tilly was bored. She knew John was having the time of his life on this trip to Europe, and she was happy for him. Really. It was just that this was her sixth castle visit since they came here to backpack across Europe for their honeymoon a month ago. She knew she had agreed to all of the stops that they would make in advance, but it was getting tiresome. Old buildings were John's thing, not hers. She preferred the food and the excitement of being in cities that were hundreds and hundreds of years older than her hometown of Hershey, Nebraska could ever claim to be. 1892, she thought, was nothing compared to Prague and its founding around 880. There was just something about the energy of a place like that, which cornfields and silos just couldn't compete. She reckoned she had expected a bit more from being married than trudging through old ruins and listening to stories about people she'd never heard of and wouldn't remember later. John did make up for it when they were alone, but still... She suddenly started out of her reverie, realizing the tour company minivan had just pulled up the drive of their next stop, a place called Lep Castle. Lost in her thoughts, she completely tuned out the tour guide who had been telling them the story of the place. Oh well, if you've seen one, you've seen them all, she guessed. John nudged her and started pointing out different features of the tower house construction, as well as the grounds as they pulled up. Tilly smiled and nodded, trying to seem interested, but she was now starting to think about lunch at the pub that was on the schedule for later that day. Once the van stopped and the doors opened, John grabbed their camera and day pack and jumped out. Tilly pulled her long blonde hair up into a ponytail, stilled herself, and followed. As the group gathered by the door, Tilly thought that she saw a couple of little girls standing at the edge of the group, looking at her through the corner of her eye, and they appeared to be in period dress. Oh, she thought, it's going to be one of those tours. John is going to love this. She turned to give them a smile, since she figured they were likely the caretaker's children and didn't have a say in whether or not they participated in the tours. But they weren't there. Hmm, she thought. I was pretty sure I saw them. But maybe these tours are all running together, and I imagined it. Suddenly, there was a sharp tug on her braid. She let out a gasp of pain and spun around, but there was no one there. She definitely didn't imagine that. It really hurt. John leaned over and asked if she was okay. She nodded and said that she was. But when he straightened up, the tour guide was smiling at her. Got your hair, Pulas, he said and chuckled. The wee spirits here like blondes. He then turned for the front door and entered. The group filed in behind him with Tilly at the rear of the line, starting to regret the stop even more. Just before she reached the door, she thought she heard a noise above her. She stepped back away from the door and looked up. There, high above her, she could see the two girls at the top of the tower. What were they playing at? That was dangerous. They shouldn't be up there. Just as the thought came to her mind, one of the little girls began to lean over the side and then toppled over and began to fall. The little girl screamed, And Tilly screamed as she started to move to the spot where she was going to head to try to help. She had to help this little girl. With the tears flowing, Tilly watched this little girl fall and the screams echoing off the stone walls, deafening in her ears. But just before she hit, the little girl vanished without a trace. Tilly collapsed to the ground and began to weep. Welcome to another episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Ward. And I am your host, Molly Malloy. As always, it's great having you tuning in. If this is your first episode, then welcome. If it's not your first episode, then welcome back. 
Each week, Molly and I take a drive along the Information Superhighway to find topics that we find interesting, obscure, funny, or downright bizarre, and then bring them to the show to share with you, our listeners, all in the hopes that we can make your commute suck just a little less. You can find all previous episodes at the Road Tripping Podcast for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or most wherever you listen to podcasts. To stream or download our show on your mobile device, start by opening your app and typing the Road Tripping Podcast, that's tripping with a G, into the search bar. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to our feed so you'll have access to all of our previous shows as well as all of the future goodness we're planning on bringing your way. In today's episode, we're going to be bringing you information on what has been called the most haunted castle in Ireland, known as Lep Castle. If you're a fan of the ghost hunting shows, it is likely you have heard of or have seen one of the shows where they have done investigations there. If you're like us and not a fan of the ghost hunting or Bigfoot shows where they seem to stage things for the camera, then it's likely you've never heard of the place. In either case, we hope that we will both inform and entertain you with what we have put together. Stay tuned, because we'll get down to it right after these words. More leads, less effort. Sounds good, right? Social Bee offers social media management tools, training, and teams to help you with content creations, hosting, recycling, and more. Automatically post on all major networks, organize your content into categories for the best content mix, effortlessly repost your evergreen content for maximum impact, and save lots of time in the meantime. To help the show and get your 14-day free trial, follow the link in the show notes or by clicking on the banner on our homepage at theroadtrippingpodcast.com. We use them and think you should too. Join the hive today. Lep Castle is one of the longest continuously inhabited castles in Ireland. It is located near a small roadside village called Kulderi, which is in County Offaly and not far from the Slive Bloom Mountains. It is about 138 kilometers or 85 miles west of Dublin and almost smack in the middle of the country itself. It is currently in private hands owned by Sean Ryan and his wife since 1991, but with an appointment it can be toured. You might be asking how the castle got its name because while it's pronounced Lep, when viewed in English we would say Leap. The legend says that early in the 1500s, two O'Bannon brothers were contesting the chieftainship of their clan. They needed a way to settle their argument over who it should be that would be both decisive and fair. One day they came upon a rocky outcropping where it is believed that an earlier castle had once stood and decided that it would be a perfect location to build a castle that would guard the strategic pass through the Slive Blue Mountains into Munster and the surrounding fertile farmland. They decided that since this was where they wanted to build the castle, then this would be the site to settle their disagreement once and for all. They settled on a display of strength, bravery, and determination, though it sounds more like desperation and stupidity, truth be told, as the deciding factor over who should rule. All they would have to do is both jump off the rocky outcrop where the castle was to be built. Sounds easy enough, right? Their problem was, the winner was to be the one who survived the fall to the ground below. Lep was constructed in or around 1514 by the wealthy O'Bannon clan, who were the secondary chieftains to the ruling O'Carroll clan. The core of the castle is a four-story tower that has walls two meters or nearly six and a half feet thick. In its design, it includes a meticulation, which is a projecting structure that allows the defenders to drop stones or pour burning objects onto the attackers. A bartisan on the northwest corner, which is an overhanging structure that acts as a turret for archers, and defense wall works on the grounds. It is believed that around 1571, a priest's house was added to the grounds, though today it is just an empty shell. The castle was later altered during the 17th century when the castle was occupied by the Darby family. They extended the castle and added the Jacobian house to the north face of the tower house, and later, a Georgian house was also added. The castle was attacked early in its history in 1514 by Earl of Kendare, who unsuccessfully tried to seize the castle, and then for a second time in 1516. In 1558, the castle was deliberately set on fire and ruined to prevent it from being captured by Elizabethan forces, who decided to occupy the castle anyway. It was recaptured by the O'Carrolls less than a year later. Now, 
I'm going to get into a bit of the ruling line of the O'Carrolls, so I hope I don't lose you. Just hang in there, and we'll get through it together. The O'Carrolls were a fierce and brutal clan, continuously struggling for power and supremacy. They were known to be particularly violent and cunning in the attempts for domination, and murder, particularly familiacide, was totally imbalanced for them, so the rulers of Lep tended to change rather frequently. John O'Carroll was thought to be the first prince of Eli, lived at Lep Castle before he died suffering from the plague. He was succeeded by the great Maruni O'Carroll, who earned the recognition for his strength, bravery, and leadership, who ruled for the next 42 years. Then he was succeeded by his son, Bergan again, in 1532. Fergarigan O'Carroll was rumored to have murdered a guest at the dinner table, as well as his steward, whom he killed in the guard room. Fergarigan was murdered in 1541 by O'Molois, who was succeeded by his sons, Teach the One Eyed, William, Molorohan, and Unathane. While Teach was quick to assume command, he was killed by his own kinsman, Cahir or Charles O'Carroll. Cahir was slain by Teej's younger brother, William O'Carroll, in 1551, who in turn was murdered in 1581 by his relations. William had fathered four sons, another Teej, another Maloney, a Charles, and a John. It was his son John that succeeded him, but was slain the following year, in 1582 by his cousin Mulrooney, son of Teej the One-Eyed. This murder was avenged swiftly by John's brother, Charles O'Carroll, who killed Mulrooney, then becoming the Prince of Eli. He then was slain in 1600 in retaliation as Charles had previously killed 150 of his own men and some of McMahon's nobles. It was thought Charles had come to lose trust in some of his own men, and when it came to pay them for their services, Charles and a few of his trusted men slew them where they slept. In 1629, John O'Carroll, nephew of Charles O'Carroll, was given the official ownership of the Lepp Castle, but by 1649, the property of Lepp Castle was handed over to the first of the Darby line, Jonathan Darby II, who was a soldier of the Cromillion forces in lieu of pay. It would return to the O'Carrolls in 1664 when the property was handed back to John O'Carroll due to his continued loyalty to Charles I. This arrangement was unfortunately reversed in 1667 due to the differing views of Charles II and the castle was once again back in the hands of the Darbys. Fun fact. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, one of the signers of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, is also a member of the O'Carroll clan, though a distant relation. Now, you think that was complicated. Then get a load of the Darby line. All the kids were named Jonathan. Just listen for the suffix, third, fourth, fifth, etc., to stay on track. Jonathan II had a son he named, of course, Jonathan III, who, in 1698, was tried for treason and sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered during a power shift within the British monarchy. His son was Jonathan IV, and was born in 1708 and lived until 1776. His son, you guessed it, Jonathan V, maintained the Lept estate until his death in 1802. As Jonathan V fathered no male children, Lep Castle was passed to his younger brother, Henry. Henry de Stair Darby, born in 1750, climbed through the naval ranks to become Admiral Sir Henry de Stair Darby in 1799. Henry died in 1823, bearing no children of his own. So upon Henry's death, the Lep Castle estate was inherited by his brother, John Darby. Well, John Darby died in 1834 to be succeeded by multiple children, William Henry, Christopher, George, Susan, another Jonathan, Horatio, John Nelson, and Sarah Darby. In this case, of course, it still went to the oldest heir, which was William Henry Darby. 
So William Henry Darby inherited Lepp Castle in 1880. His eldest son had died in 1872 at the age of 45, so the Lepp estate was passed to his grandson, Jonathan Charles Darby. So we got another Jonathan there. Now this Jonathan married Mildred Dill, also known as Mildred Darby, in 1889, and he lived in the castle until it was burned in 1922 during the Irish Civil War by the IRA. A party of 11 raiders set fire to Lepp, totally destroying the north and larger wings and its valuable contents. Giving evidence in the claims court, Richard Dawkins said that on 30 July 1922, he was living in the castle as caretaker with his wife and baby. They were the only persons in the castle that night. Richard Dawkins stated that at 2.20 in the morning, there was a knock on the door. He opened the window and put his head out and saw men outside who stated they wanted a night's lodging. They ordered him to open the door. He went down and opened the door and was subsequently held at gunpoint. The raiders then stated that they were going to burn the castle. Dawkins asked for time to get his wife and child out and was given 20 minutes to do so. The raiders then went into the castle and poured petrol over the rooms and set them on fire. They kept the family outside from 2.30 a.m. to 5 a.m. Each of the men had a tin of petrol and all were armed. Some had trench coats and others had bandoliers over their civilian clothes. The men broke furniture before setting the castle on fire. From 1974 to 1989, the gatehouse was rebuilt by Peter Bartlett and friend Joe Sullivan. This is when the preliminary rebuilding of the upper floors was also started. From 1991 to 2010, much rebuilding had been completed by the current owners, Sean and Anne Ryan. Now that we've gone through the history of the castle, especially about the murders, we can get to the part of the story I wanted to cover when I suggested this topic to Dean. The ghost stories. There's just something about them that always gives me a chill. However, before we do that, Dean and I would like to bring you a special message on a cause we care about. So stay tuned. Trippers, September is National Suicide Prevention Month, and we at the Road Tripping Podcast are dedicating a portion of our show for the entire month to assist in bringing awareness to the topic. We want you to know that we understand that every struggle is different, but there is hope. If you feel that you need someone to talk to, we encourage you to use the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which provides 24-7 free and confidential support via phone or chat, as well as provide you with information on finding your local crisis center. Please call 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or visit their website, suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Now back to the program. The story of Lepp Castle would not be complete without the ghost. And you can't talk about ghost unless you talk about the infamous Bloody Chapel. The Bloody Chapel is the home to many of the spirits of Lepp Castle. People passing the castle at night have reported bright light streaming out of the upper windows which has even prompted neighbors to call the Ryans to inform them that the chapel was lit up. The Ryans have insisted that it wasn't their doing if it happened. One of the most well-known ghosts is referred to as the O'Carroll priest. After the death of Mulrooney O'Carroll in 1532, a fierce power struggle developed within the remaining O'Carroll family, pitting brother against brother to gain control. Legend has it that an O'Carroll murdered his brother. A priest while performing a mass in the upper hall of the castle. It is believed that the priest started the mass before the arrival of his brother, and this was considered to be a great insult. The angered O'Carroll then flew into a rage and slaughtered his brother where he stood, dying right in front of the rest of the family upon the altar. The priest has been seen on many occasions in the bloody chapel. The spirit is also seen lurking on the stairway below, on the bartizan, and down the northern stairs. The Opulet One of the more sinister features of the bloody chapel is the Opulet. The Opulet is a small chamber located in the northeastern corner of the bloody chapel. It's thought that the original use for these chambers was to store valuables. They were also used as a place to hide in the event of a siege. The O'Carrolls, however, 
use this chamber for a more sinister purpose. They modified this chamber to serve as a small dungeon where prisoners were thrown in, dead or dying. The entrance to the chamber is a narrow hole originally fitted with the form of a trap door. The name is derived from the French, to forget. During the construction of the Lep Castle by the Darbys, the opulette was cleaned and the contents removed during some of the renovations carried out. It is said that three cartloads of skeletons were removed from the obelette during this period. Some believe that since this gruesome discovery, an emotional shockwave was sent through the castle, and many of the spirits, including the elemental, were woken from their dormancy. Sean Ryan speaks of a man who seems to live in the obelette. He leaves the bloody chapel on occasion and wanders down to the lower levels of the castle. The Elemental The Elemental is one of the most interesting spirits that reside at Lep Castle. It is an entity that is shrouded in mystery and intrigue because an elemental is not a ghost of a person or animal, but of a spirit or a mass of energy that has been given form. The first encounter, origin, and exact nature of the Elemental at Lep is unknown. There are many theories that have circulated over the years. One early belief is that the elemental was put there by druids long before the castle was built to protect the sacred site used for initiations and druidic magics. Another theory is that it was placed there by an invading force to burn the castle from the inside. The person responsible is thought to be Gerald Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare. He was a renowned magic practitioner and had attempted to take over the castle on several occasions. However, the local myth is that it is the spirit of an ancient O'Carroll who died in the castle from leprosy, and that is why there is said to be the stench that accompanies the presence of the spirit. Mildred Darby, who we mentioned earlier, was said to have dabbled in the occult, and it is believed that it is possible that her activities, which focused on seances and automatic writing, somehow either woke the elemental or summoned it. Either way, it was shortly after the obelette was discovered that Mildred Darby had her first encounter with the elemental. The best descriptions we have are those given by Mildred and an associate staying at Lep. This is the description as written in the Occult Review article, Kilman Castle, The House of Horror. Suddenly, two hands were laid on my shoulders. I turned round sharply and saw, as clearly as I see you now, a great thing standing a couple of feet from me with its bent arms raised as if they were cursing me. I cannot describe in words how utterly awful the thing was, its very indefinableness rendering the horrible shadow more gruesome. Human in shape, a little shorter than I am, I could just make out the shape of big black holes like great eyes and sharp features, but the whole figure, head, face, hands and all, was gray, unclean, a bluish gray, something of the color and appearance of common cotton wool. But oh, so sinister, repulsive and devilish. My friends who are clever about occult things say it is what they call an elemental. The thing was about the size of a sheep, thin, gaunt, and shadowy in parts. Its face was human, or to be more accurate, inhuman. In its vileness with large holes of blackness for eyes, loose slobbery lips, a thick saliva dripping jaw sloping back suddenly into its neck. Nose it had none, only spreading, cancerous cavities, the whole face being a uniform tint of gray. This too was the color of the dark coarse hair covering its head, neck, and body. Its forearms were thickly coated with the same hair. So were its paws, large, loose, and hand-shaped, and it sat on its hind legs. One hand or paw was raised, and a claw-like finger was extended ready to scratch the paint. Its lusterless eyes, which seemed half decomposed and looked incredibly foul, stared into mine, and the horrible smell which had before offended my nostrils, only a hundred times intensified, came up to my face, filling me with deadly nausea. I noticed the lower half of the creature was indefinite and seemed semi-transparent. At least I could see the framework of the door that led into the gallery through its body. The Lady in Rad One of the spirits encountered from the time of the Darbys is known as the Lady in Rad. 
She's been described as a very tall woman clothed in a red dress. She's been seen carrying a dagger in her hand, raised in a menacing manner. A strange luminescence is seen radiating within her. People encountering the spirit have commented on an immense cold feeling in the room and permeating into their heart. It's thought that this woman was captured by an O'Carroll and subsequently raped. The baby born as a result was then killed by an O'Carroll, reasoning that they could not afford to feed the child. Distraught, the woman then killed herself with the same blade. A guest at the Derby submitted their account to the Oculate Review. I went to my bedroom. It was about 11 p.m. During the night, the time was about 12.45 a.m., as I subsequently saw by my watch. I felt that I was awakened by someone in my room. It was pitch dark, and at first, I could see nothing. I was wide awake with an extraordinary cold feeling at my heart that rapidly increased in intensity. Almost immediately, I felt, as much as I saw, that there was a tall figure in the middle of the room. My first impression was that an O'Carroll himself was there, as no other member of the household would correspond to the height. What is it? I asked. There was no answer, but now I could see. Dimly at first, and with increasing distinction, that the tall figure was clothed from head to foot in red, and with his right hand raised menacing in the air. To my utter astonishment, I could see that the light which illuminated the figure was from within, having very much the effect of the dark lantern used in a photographer's room. As the figure advanced towards me, the light increased, and I could see distinctly that the form was of a very tall woman holding some sort of a weapon, knife or dagger in her hand, what is it? I asked again, adding, Who is it? And then hurriedly struck a match and lit my candle. As the flame of the match and candle illuminated the room, I looked all around. The room is empty. Note that the name O'Carroll was used by the author of the letter, obviously to preserve the anonymity of the castle with Mildred Darby's wishes. Mildred Darby makes mention of this spirit in her article, Kilman Castle, The House of Horror. There is a tall, dark woman in a historic scarlet silk dress that rustles. She haunts the blue room, which always was used to be the nursery, and sobs at the foot of the children's beds. Trivers, Molly and I hope you've enjoyed our look into Lep Castle and its bloody history. While the Ryans swear that the spirits are there and for the most part they leave them alone, I am personally still skeptical. Molly, on the other hand, fully believes that the energy of the place is holding the spirits there, and since the level of death has been so high, it is undeniably haunted. I think we will just have to settle this with a future trip to Ireland to see for ourselves. Well, that's all the time we have for in this episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. But if you liked it and want to hear more, please subscribe to the show feed and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast directory. The more positive reviews we receive, the more trippers we'll be able to find us, and the faster we will grow, thus being able to bring you new content. Be sure to visit our website, theroadtrippingpodcast.com, that's tripping with a G, to keep updated on future shows, leave show suggestions, and see all the ways to find and interact with us all in one place. If you are able and feeling generous, then a link to our Patreon page can be found under the support link on the homepage. We've been your hosts, Dean Ward and Molly Malloy, and the Road Tripping Podcast is recorded and produced at Before Midnight Studio. As always, until next we meet, stay safe, trippers. Trippers.